Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Seem Lund and in this video I'm going to give you the full guide to doing intermittent fasting in 2023. So uh, intermittent fasting is not going anywhere and uh, this is going to be a full breakdown of what is fasting, how to do it and uh, what are the newest and uh, most accurate research about doing it. Do it. If you're new to the channel, if you haven't heard about me before, then I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is Seem Lund. I'm from Estonia. I'm a multiple best-selling author. I've uh, written by now, yeah, like seven books <laughs> that many of them have been co-authored with Dr. James De Nicola Antonio. I'm also an anthropologist. I'm a keynote speaker. I consider myself like, like a biohacker or yeah, like that's what I do. And but uh, yeah, like everything involved around health, fitness, performance, and just overall uh, well-being and a lot of it longevity wise as well. So let's start with some of the basics. What is intermittent fasting? Well, essentially fasting is just like not eating and intermittent fasting refers to doing that intermittently. No, not many people, you know, when they say intermittent fasting, then they mean like the 16 and 8 method where they fast 16 hours and eat within 8 hours. So that's a form of intermittent fasting by definition, uh, or by definition, it's more like time restricted eating because you're confining your daily eating window in a certain time frame. Intermittent fasting actually is usually, you know, that you're eating on one day, you're not eating another day, and you're kind of like uh, swapping between periods of eating and fasting. But for the sake of simplicity and, uh, you know, for the sake of just making, keeping it simple, uh, we'll just uh, stick to the same uh, term of intermittent fasting throughout the video to describe this uh, general way of eating where you are just, you know, confining your daily eating window in a certain time frame. And in that time frame, generally, you're not allowed to consume calories that would uh, you know, generally stop the fast state and uh, you're just yeah, staying in a fast state which refers to pretty much allowing your body to run on its own uh, backup energy stores. And uh, yeah, when you are in a fast state, then you go through different physiological processes. So that doesn't occur generally when you are eating regularly. So most people, they just eat multiple meals per day that uh, when they eat, then uh, they obviously raise blood sugar, they raise insulin, and they also keep their body in a fit state, which is different from being in a fast state. And uh, the biggest differences have to do with the different pathways that get turned on inside the body when you're eating versus when you're fasting. And uh, when you're fasting, for example, then you start to burn more fat, your fat oxidation increases, eventually you're going to go into ketosis, you're going to suppress the growth pathways in the body that uh, actually have some longevity benefits, and uh, you conduct this kind of you know, self cleaning, for lack of a better word, that uh, you're removing dysfunctional cell components with the process of autophagy. And uh, yeah, you're ju just pretty much allowing your body to rest and uh, not digest <laughs> food that happens if you're just eating multiple times per day. And uh, when it comes to these pathways, the uh, fasted and fed pathways, then uh, there's pretty much like two main ones that uh, exist or the two like umbrella pathways. And when you're feeding, when you're eating, you have consumed calories, then generally you um, are in an anabolic and fed state, which uh, activates this complex in the body called mTOR, mammalian target of uh, rapamycin, which then uh, helps with protein synthesis, muscle growth, cell replication, survival, and uh, that kind of thing. In excess, the mTOR complex has been, you know, considered to accelerate aging and uh, be linked to some cancers and malignancies, but obviously it's very kind of nuanced and it not necessarily applies to humans all the time. But uh, in my opinion, you know, excess mTOR still has like some negative side effects. It can speed up immunosenescence, it can weaken your immune system over time, um, and uh, I think it would also have like a downstream effect on aging overall if you're like eating around the clock without any time restrictions. So that's why doing some form of time restricted time restricted eating or in fasting may have uh, yeah like just uh, some of these benefits that you don't get if you're just eating all the time and a lot of those benefits are mediated by the kind of the fasting complex or the kind of calorie restriction complex called AMPK amp activated protein kinase which is more of like a, this catabolic pathway in the body that uh, regulates autophagy it regulates NAD recycling which uh, helps with energy production helps to pretty much maintain better metabolic health over the long term and to slow down aging. And um, yeah, this AMPK is more of like a survival 
complex survival uh, pathway that uh, gets activated under these kinds of energy stressors like intermittent fasting, calorie restriction, uh, or exercise. So these are the main differences between being fed and fasted. If you're fasting, then over time you activate AMPK and you suppress mTOR. When you're fed, you turn off AMPK and you activate the mTOR, the growth pathway. And uh, these uh, like sensors or complexes create this triad that uh, regulate your body's energy homeostasis or energy balance. And uh, like we talked about, mTOR is the one that promotes protein synthesis and cell growth. And this one gets turned on when primarily amino acids, like the amino acids and protein are the main trigger for mTOR, but carbohydrates do that as well. Uh, but generally, like any amount of calories, even if it's fat, it doesn't raise insulin, but it still turns on mTOR eventually in larger quantities. The AMPK is uh, activated mostly by nutrient deficiency and um, energy restriction. So when you are fasting on the calorie restriction uh, or using a lot of energy as well, like during exercise, which then helps to initiate the process of autology that uh, regulates cell recycling, cell uh, cleaning, and uh, just... Um, you know, maintenance work. Autology is mostly regulated by amino acid de deficiency, that uh, you need to be on a lower, like, amino acid, let's say, state or have less amino acids in your bloodstream for autology to initiate because mTOR is a direct inhibitor of autology. And um, when you are eating protein and uh, amino acids, then you don't really go into autology because the mTOR is blocking the formation of these autologosomes that uh, do these um, cell recycling and eliminate these uh, dysfunctional components of the cell. And, uh, you know, these pathways obviously are balancing each other all the time. They can't coexist simultaneously. You can't have autology and mTOR activated at the same time. You can only cycle between them. You can only be in a state of growth for one period of a time and then switch over to a fasted state and vice versa. So you can't exist, you can't get best of both worlds all the time. Uh, you need to have periods of, you know, cycling. And that's where this interval fasting concept is so, like, powerful that uh, you're not really, like, you don't need to restrict anything. You don't need to restrict protein. You don't need to restrict carbohydrates in terms of being on a low-protein diet for the rest of your life or being on a low-carb diet for the rest of your life. The main tenet, the main idea is to cycle between periods of eating and fasting that then automatically pretty much activates these pathways in the right amounts and uh, prevents them from becoming, you know, excess, excess mTOR is bad, but excess autology and excess AMPK activation is also bad. So like the feeding is almost as important as the fasting when it comes to intermittent fasting, in my opinion, because that's when you achieve the best body composition. That's where you achieve the best metabolic health. And that's where you achieve also best energy levels, best sleep and the best, um, you know, fitness, best well-being, how you feel on a daily basis. That's achieved only through the cycling component, not being in one state for too long. And uh, yeah, like we talked about, these pathways balance each other. Things that turn on these longevity pathways and survival pathways through AMPK are, you know, calorie restriction, exercise, fasting, and different kinds of hormetic stressors. Uh, when it comes to, you know, the sedentary lifestyle behavior and the unhealthy lifestyle behavior, then obviously that has like a negative side effect or negative effect on these uh, processes. And if you achieve that, then um, achieve that balance and achieve the activation of these pathways, then you're going to pretty much, yeah, have a positive effect on longevity overall, which includes DNA repair, mitochondrial biogenesis, stress resistance, autophagy, reducing inflammation, telomere maintenance, etc. And uh, as a result, you postpone the development of these chronic diseases and uh, have a positive effect on longevity overall. So let's move on with the effects of fasting. What are the actual studies showing how does fasting and time restricted eating affect our uh, bodies and health? You know, uh, there are actually quite a lot of studies by now showing that the general interval fasting has some positive effects on the body. Whether or not it's superior to calorie restriction is up for debate. Uh, I think that obviously you can't eat as many calories as you want when you're doing intermittent fasting. You still need to like find some restriction in that because otherwise you'll just um, gain weight or you'll just mess up your bio biomarkers by doing that. So fasting isn't like a free pass. Uh, you still have to be on a like a good diet and you still have to be kind of uh, optimal with your calorie intake. 
but uh, some of the effects of fasting um, are like something that uh, happen also in spite of the calorie restriction. So many people who do in a fasting, then they end up eating less calories automatically. But there are also other effects that happen in the fasted state, uh, such as, you know, reduction in inflammation and uh, increased autophagy, etc., etc., which aren't not necessarily only because of the calorie restriction, which doesn't mean that you can't activate these things with calorie restriction. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the health benefits of fasting don't always come from the weight loss. Like the benefits of fasting can also come from just being in the fasted state. So what are the long-term effects of intermittent fasting? You know, most of it has to do with your yeah, better metabolic health and uh, better biomarkers. You'll have generally like better blood sugar levels, better uh, blood pressure, better triglycerides, and uh, better insulin sensitivity and those kind of things. Uh, you also become more keto adapted, which means that um, you'll be able to burn more fat more easily and tap into ketosis faster, uh, which uh, then able enables you to like, you know, swap between different fuel sources. You'll be less hungry when you're fasting. And, um, you know, the key part is to also eat carbohydrates every once in a while to maintain the insulin sensitivity. If you're prolonging this fasted state for too long or being in ketosis for too long too often, then uh, your insulin sensitivity will suffer slightly. So again, the cycling component is where the magic happens generally. And swapping between these different pathways between fat burning and burning carbohydrates, that's what trains your metabolism. That's what uh, kind of teaches your metabolism to be more flexible and to, to achieve like more optimal uh, functioning in the process. And if you don't do that, you know, you're always eating carbohydrates again, then you know, you're not really achieving that metabolic flexibility either. You're not able to burn fat and you're pretty much, you know, uh, shooting yourself in the foot <laughs> in terms of the optimal, you know, um, functioning of the cell. That's how, that's how humans are supposed to kind of function. We are supposed to be in ketosis for some periods of the time, but at other periods of the time, we also have to kind of, you know, do the opposite and uh, change things up. That's kind of makes your cells more resistant or resilient and uh, makes your health more robust overall as well. So calorie restriction, as well as intermittent fasting and physical exercise, they're all forms of hormesis that uh, do, you know, cause stress to the body, but that stress actually makes you stronger. The, that's the concept of, you know, stronger by stress or hormesis, that over time, your uh, body becomes more resilient and uh, increases resistance to stressors, increases or improves your immune system function, improves your metabolic health, and just has like a positive effect on your overall health. And hormesis is a dose specific response, not like it's not like a linear <laughs> response that the more you do it, the better it is. Like with everything, moderation is the key. If you exercise too much, then that will eventually harm your health. Likewise with fasting, if you do too much fasting, it's going to harm your health. If you do too much calorie restriction for too long, that's going to harm your health. And yeah, pretty much everything has this bell curve or the uh, optimal amount that is uh, giving the benefits. If you don't do any of exercise, then that's harmful because you, you know, obviously lose fitness and you start to gain weight. If you do too much exercise, then that can cause overtraining and uh, weaken your immune system. So the benefit, the most optimal amount is somewhere in the middle. Like the exact amount depends on the individual, depends on the situation, but uh, you want to have like this bell curve effect for pretty much all these stressors. Not enough is not optimal and too much can also be harmful. And uh, hormesis is also like a, an example of antifragility, or much rather antifragility is based on the concept of hormesis, which means that some, some stressors can make you stronger, and um, they can actually make you more resilient, which almost describes the mythological creature Hydra. So the Hydra, it had like multiple heads, if you cut one head off, then it grows two heads instead so it becomes stronger from the small stress and that applies to like exercise if you do exercise in the immediate short term you get slightly weaker but over the long term you're uh, much fitter and uh, much uh, stronger overall and fasting is a similar example like uh, you want to start you know where you're at you don't want to immediately go into like the most hardcore of fasting you want to step by step gradually get better at it and over time your uh, resilience will increase and uh you will, you know, get healthier and more robust overall. 
if you're like not doing any of these hormetic stressors, you're not exercising, you're not doing any like saunas or you're not doing any intermittent fasting, then that generally leads to more fragility and frailty. Like uh, your immune system will weaken uh, your, because our bodies need this kind of small hormetic stress and we need this small kind of exercise to maintain the most optimal uh, functioning. And in the modern world, we're not like it's not mandatory to fast, it's not mandatory to exercise, we can get away with being sedentary and just sitting on a couch and overeating, but obviously that will just, you know, that's what we. That's why we have such a problem with uh, health. Uh, many people just suffer from uh, poor health and obesity because they're not doing any of the difficult things, they're not doing on any of the stressors voluntarily, they're just uh, choosing the easy way out. <laughs> so as individuals who want to achieve optimal health, we just have to impose this hormetic stress on ourselves, which includes, you know, voluntary regular exercise and some aspects of time restricted eating and intermittent fasting. Uh, calorie restriction is uh, one of the most known, like, uh, ways to extend lifespan in other species, and it has been found to have positive effects in humans as well. So in this human study, they did find that calorie restriction for a few weeks uh, had like these positive effects in increasing autology, increasing DNA repair, apoptosis or programmed cell death, increasing antioxidant defense, activating these different longevity pathways like sirtuins and AMPK, suppressing mTOR, and uh, promoting mitochondrial biogenesis as well as reducing inflammation. So calorie restriction, yeah, does a lot of the same things as intermittent fasting, that uh, it has a similar positive effect on the um, longevity and lifespan. And in uh, like uh, primate and uh, monkey studies, they find that uh, the calorie restriction also extends lifespan. Uh, so yeah, like eating less calories generally has somewhat of a positive effect on longevity because of these different processes that get turned on while being under that state. So this small hormetic stress uh, is what uh, yields those benefits. In humans, you know, calorie restriction definitely will have some benefits, but you can't do it for long because you also need to obviously have some aspects of fitness. You need to have some muscle strength and muscle mass, which are also linked to longevity. If you're under calorie restriction for too long all the time, then uh, that could lead to like frailty, sarcopenia, osteoporosis, and those kind of things. So, um, you know, there needs to be a balance between eating enough calories while still getting the benefits of calorie restriction, uh, which uh, intermittent fasting can actually mimic those effects. And uh, calorie restriction is quite hard to do over the long term. Whereas if you confine your eating, you know, in a certain time frame, then that is what um, most people generally can find a bit more easier to do. So yeah, like David Sinclair, who is a lot of renowned like, longevity researcher, uh, he has also said that yeah, it's uh, quite hard to be hungry all the time if you're doing calorie restriction. And uh, this is where like inward fasting can help to mimic a lot of the benefits of calorie restriction without necessarily being on a very low calorie diet. Because to calorie restriction to work, you need to be yeah under quite a severe calorie restriction. You need at least like 30% of calorie restriction to uh, pretty much have those uh, effects. But with inward fasting, you can pretty much turn on the same pathways. You can see similar effects by just confining the eating window, which again doesn't mean that you can eat unlimited amount of calories, but it does mean that you can eat a bit more calories than you normally would have to do when you're doing this um, severe calorie restriction. At least that's what most of the you know researchers have concluded by now that uh, yeah, intermittent fasting, it's not magic, but it can help to mimic some aspects of calorie restriction. When it comes to weight loss, then yeah, you still need to be in a calorie restriction, but uh, when it comes to these longevity pathways and these other processes, metabolic processes that happen underneath, then intermittent fasting is a great way to like mimic those effects and um, get away with less calorie restriction. All right, so let's move on with time restricted eating, which is a component of the circadian rhythms or a concept of circadian biology, and uh, what it essentially means it's just uh, intermittent fasting or uh, confining your eating window in a certain time frame. There are types of it like early time restricted eating and late time restricted eating and the studies on both of them uh, have found that uh, yeah the time restricted eating has health benefits uh, compared to the standard way of eating like it's gonna be better for your metabolic profile and blood pressure uh, 
But obviously many of those effects can come from just eating less calories in that time frame. If you say to people that, hey, eat only between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m., then uh, they will automatically just start eating less calories generally. Uh, whereas if you eat around the clock without any restrictions, then there's going to be more like possibilities and opportunities to eat, which is why the time street eating can have like this good like adherence uh, effect for most people. When it comes to eating early versus late, then uh, the studies find that, um, yeah, the early time street eating has a little bit of a better effect when it comes to like the weight loss is the same, but when it comes to the metabolic profile, then early time street eating uh, has been found to have like small improvement compared to late time street eating. But the, the difference whether or not it's significant depends on the other aspects, like depends on when you exercise, how well you sleep, how many calories you're eating in the time window and etc. Uh, but uh, overall, yeah, like the pretty much there have been like multiple studies in 2022 even uh, going through early time sheet eating versus late time sheet eating. And they sh they, sh they see pretty much all the time that uh, early time sheet eating has somewhat of a better effect in like uh, the blood pressure, the fasting glucose levels, fasting insulin, uh, insulin resistance and uh, metabolic health overall. Both of them help with weight loss. Um, but uh, early time sheet eating has like a somewhat of a better effect. And uh, yeah, as you can see from this graph, from that study, that uh, yeah, they eat very similarly in terms of calories. Uh, but, you know, in this study, the early time sheet eating group actually ate a little bit less uh, on average. Uh, but um, yeah, the results are also somewhat better compared to uh, like late time sheet eating. But the good thing about it is that both of these groups do better than the controls generally. Like the, both of the time sheeting groups, whether they are early or late, do slight, slightly better than control groups, uh, where they eat you know around the clock without any restrictions. And uh, yeah, both of them can help with weight loss compared to controls. Uh, both of them have less fat mass. Uh, and interestingly, early time sheeting group actually loses a bit more uh, muscle mass which is uh, interesting uh, probably because you, you know you're most anabolic when you're sleeping and if you're going into a bed with like very empty stomach and without any amino acids in your bloodstream then um, chances are yeah you're going to be more catabolic or you know you're going to be more prone to losing muscle compared to eating somewhat uh, later so what i take away from this in my own life is that yeah i don't want to eat immediately before bed i don't want to eat very late um, I do want to, you know, have like early dinner, uh, but I don't, I don't need to necessarily eat in the morning all my calories. Like, I don't think that's the kind of main message. The main message should be that uh, don't eat immediately before bed. Stop eating, you know, optimally like four hours uh, before bed or something like that. And that's, you, that's, that's where you're going to get like the best of both worlds. And most people, I don't think that they're able to do early times of eating because, you know, dinners are the most sociable um, event of the day for most people. Uh, that's where the families eat dinner together. That's where you go out with friends or whatever. Uh, so it's very hard to like, you know, skip dinner in most cases. Uh, but you, what you should do still is to like not have the dinner uh, too late, in my opinion. Uh, and um, yeah, again, kind of similar results that the early time sheet eating group generally does a bit better, but both of them do better than the um, control group in most cases. So time restricted eating is a concept of uh, circadian uh, rhythms and um, for optimal health you also want to maintain circadian rhythm alignment. Food is a huge uh, regulator of the circadian rhythms and uh, the circadian clocks in your body. If you're just eating around the clock then you can mess up the clocks and if you eat too late you can also mess up the clocks and cause circadian disruption. Um, so uh, humans are diurnal creatures we're supposed to be awake during daytime, we're supposed to be active during daytime, and we're supposed to sleep at night. So in the morning, uh, the cortisol rises, that's where you start to burn fat, that's where you increase your energy, peaks at 9 a.m. and wraps down for the rest of the day. Melatonin, the sleep hormone, rises before bed and uh, reaches its peak at midnight and then drops, drops down. Melatonin, what it does is actually makes you somewhat insulin resistant. So uh, that's why you don't want to eat at night. You don't want to eat immediately before bed because your uh, glucose disposal 
would be uh, worse. So, uh, and you'll have like worse fasting blood sugar levels in the morning as well. Whereas cortisol can also make you somewhat insulin resistant. Um, so you don't want to eat like immediately before or immediately after waking up either. So, uh, you know, what I like to do is to just wait a few hours after waking up and definitely stop eating like four hours before bed, something like that. Autophagy, which is the cell recycling process, and that also actually has a circadian rhythm and uh, autophagy, you know, starts to process mostly during the, the night. It's not really active uh, during the daytime and it uh, peaks actually in the early morning, uh, similar to like the cortisol uh, rise. So, uh, yeah, another reason why not to eat immediately before bed and not to eat immediately after waking up. You want to have like, you know, a buffer from both ends. You want to have a few hours after waking up until you eat and a few hours before bed you stop eating so uh, in the morning your uh, cortisol levels are at its highest that make you somewhat insulin resistant it's not the best time to eat at that point and uh, ghrelin the hunger hormone generally rises immediately after waking up uh, if you have a healthy metabolism but it drops down for the rest of the day um, as well if you, if you don't like you know, immediately eat so ghrelin actually has some health benefits as well like it increase uh, growth hormone and uh, it can like promote some of the activation of AMPK and uh, these other like survival pathways. But obviously, if you have high amounts of ghrelin all the time, then you can just overeat whenever you do have the opportunity to eat. Uh, but uh, like there is no like this progressive increase in hunger uh, when you uh, fast. You, you're not hungrier at fasting 16 hours versus fasting for 12 hours uh, or three days even. Like generally the hunger plateaus and it comes and goes in waves to just you know what to expect and growth hormone uh, rises as well a few hours after waking up uh, which again helps with the fat burning helps with muscle maintenance and has like some longevity benefits as well so again you know a few hours after waking up is what is when you want to have your first meal if you do choose to have like um, like uh, multiple meals uh, and uh, the reason for that is yeah this uh, rising cortisol rising growth hormone uh, that uh, wouldn't ha happen, the growth hormone wouldn't rise if you eat like a bowl of cereal immediately after uh, waking up. So you need to wait a few hours for this to uh, kick in. And if I were to like put together like some sort of a food clock or like the time frame in which to eat, then I would say that the most optimal time frame to eat in is between like 10 a.m. and 6 or 7 p.m. Uh, because yeah, like in the morning, it's the cortisol rise that is not recommended to eat, and in the evening or at night time, it's the melatonin that uh, should stop you from eating or prevent you from uh, eating. And uh, your most insulin sensitive at daytime between you know ten and twelve, and um, you also have you know best physical performance in the afternoon. So this is the best time to kind of eat, in my opinion. All right, so let's move on with the types of uh, fasting. What are the different types of uh, doing that? So uh, the th three main categories, that, in my opinion, are the 16 and 8 method, uh, which uh, is just uh, like skipping breakfast and eating lunch and dinner or whatever form of doing it. But the main idea is to just uh, fast for 16 hours and eat within eight hours. Uh, that is very simple. I think most people can do it. It's actually pretty good for being able to progress at the gym and make gains. And you don't really, yeah, like need to ever change it. It's if there's one fasting window that you could do for the rest of your life, then uh, that's it. That's the kind of the most um, easiest thing to do. There's also one meal a day, OMAD, uh, which is, yeah, just eat one meal a day or within a certain time frame. In my opinion, that's not uh, the most like, um, uh, suitable for uh, beginners and it can definitely be harder a lot harder than the 16 and 8 it's uh, not the best for muscle growth it's actually very hard to build muscle with and it requires more adaptation uh, the negative side effects of OMAD can be that uh, you can like slow down your thyroid function you can cause like this metabolic adaptation and uh, definitely for uh, women it's not suitable in my opinion uh, either um, whereas men can get away with OMAD but if they do it too much or if they combine it with a lot of the other stressors, then uh, they can, again, su suffer from low thyroid or re reduce the testosterone levels. There's also alternative fasting, ADF, which uh, means that you uh, fast one day and eat the next day. So uh, this is actually 
quite effective for weight loss and it has a lot of research showing that it helps with diabetes and just metabolic syndrome and other things like that. Alternative fasting is very well researched. It um, has been found to work and it uh, pretty much is quite, you know, adherable as well. It's it's somewhat harder again than the 16 and 8 obviously, but uh, again, it's easier than like a multi-day, three-day fast or something like that. I personally don't think that it's uh, worthwhile to do a lot of alternative fasting or at least like you don't want to do alternative fasting indefinitely. You can do it like, you know, a few times a month, one cycle, but uh, if you do it like, you know, back to back all the time for the rest of your life, then I don't think that's generally not uh, suitable for most people. Like obviously some people can pull it off, but um, the general public or the average person don't need to do it in the first place. And um, yeah, it's not uh, inherently necessary or recommended. Uh, when it comes to eating frequency, then uh, there was actually one 2022 study that looked at three meals a day versus one meal a day, and uh, they found some interesting things from that. The uh, one meal a day group lost more weight because they ate also a bit less calories, but they also lost a bit more uh, muscle tissue. Uh, but they also lost, you know, more fat tissue than the three meals a day. So yeah, like just the one meal a day group will lose more weight, but there's will, but there's going to be a bit more uh, lean tissue loss as well. So um, again, one meal a day can work for a lot of people. I myself do it. Yeah, I've done it for multiple years, but uh, it has like the potential downside that it could lead to some additional muscle loss as well. But the other biomarkers improve with both of them, granted that, that uh, you're in a calorie restriction. And uh, when it comes to the glucose levels, the 24-hour glucose levels, then uh, yeah, when you're eating one meal a day, then your average blood sugar levels during the daytime when you're fasting are lower than the three meals a day. But they rise to kind of normal, regular levels when you uh, do eat eventually. When the one meal a day group or three meals a day group, they, they eat and yeah, obviously the blood sugar levels will be higher overall on average because they're just eating multiple meals. All right, so let's move on with uh, what breaks a fast because that's a very common question pretty much uh, everyone has all the time. Here's a list of the things that don't break a fast, that don't inhibit the adaptations that occur in the fast state or the pathways that get activated in the fast state. So anything that is zero calories, like water, mineral water, are fine. Coffees and teas are fine. Um, they don't have any calories. I mean, they do have like, you know, two calories or something like that, but uh, it's so small that it doesn't uh, have any effects. And in fact, coffee and teas both actually increase autophagy. So it's very uh, shown that both the caffeine as well as the polyphenols in coffees and teas uh, promote autophagy. So it, in 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 some cases or in some sense the coffee and tea actually enhance the benefits of fasting or they speed up the benefits of fasting you get the benefits faster and uh, or they mimic fasted physiology and they mimic calorie restriction by activating these pathways uh, apple cider vinegar does a similar uh, response that it activates AMPK helps with fat burning and ketosis lowers blood sugar uh, diet soda you know obviously is very controversial uh, people say that you shouldn't drink diet soda or whatever. I'm not telling you if you should drink it or not. Uh, but the point is that diet soda, there's nothing about diet soda that would actually, you know, stop a fasted state, in my opinion. Uh, there is no, there hasn't been anything that would indicate that, like, the, the amount of calories is very small. It has, like, you know, five calories and uh, it's not enough to pretty much kick you out of a fasted state. There's also the argument that it raises insulin, which, um, or raises blood sugar, I mean, I tried with the CGM, I had a CGM, I drank the Diet Coke and my blood sugar actually dropped down, which you could say that, yeah, my insulin rised, which lowered my blood sugar, but uh, I don't think that it matters. Like, I mean, there's many things that raise that, like you can exercise and exercise could also then kick you out of a fast state based on that argument. But um, yeah, in my opinion, it's just not, there's nothing about it that would indicate that it could like you know, break a fast or something. Uh, like I said, I'm not saying that you, that it's a healthy drink. <laughs> I'm not saying that you should drink it or something, but uh, I'm just, you know, looking at the facts and looking at the effects, the physiology of uh, what happens from the microbiome side, then uh, there's also nothing, nothing there that could like, you know, say that it breaks a fast or something like that. Uh, uh, supplements, most of the supplements are also not going to break a fast. Like uh, even if it has like fish oil or 
vitamin D that's inside some sort of um, oil, the amount is so small that it's not going to break fast. And uh, like magnesium is not going to break it fast. Some of the mineral supplements, uh, some vitamin supplements, they're not going to break fast. And they're kind of, you know, whether or not you should take them in a fast state is different. Some of the supplements are fat soluble. You want to take them with food or with some fats. But uh, at least they're not going to break fast. Maybe you're wasting them if you're taking a fast state, but you're not like stopping the fast state, if that makes sense. Um, MCT oil, so uh, and like olive oil as well, in your pure fat, uh, is not going to inherently break fast in smaller amounts because it doesn't raise insulin, it doesn't affect your blood sugar. Um, and uh, the ketones that rise from the MCT oil actually can help help with uh, some of the facet physiology and like fat burning. And exogenous ketones, the same, uh, they don't like obviously, they don't have like calories in large amounts that would break a fast. Uh, in large amounts, they can still activate mTOR and insulin, the same with, with uh, fats. So it like super large amounts of MCT oil, like in Bulletproof Coffee, uh, that would also still inhibit the fast, but like 100 calories of MCT oil is not going to do it, but 1000 calories uh, probably will. Uh, electrolyte powders, so like LMNT or these other just electrolyte drinks, even if they have some sweeteners like stevia, they're not going to break the fast. Uh, chewing gum is uh, also with like maybe two calories, but uh, it's not going to break the fast and uh, it's not going to have any effect, even if it has like some uh, sort of sweetener or something like that. Here are the things that do break a fast. So sugar sweetened beverages, so uh, regular Coke, <laughs> regular uh, electrolytes with like Gatorade or something like that, that's going to break a fast. Juices, everything has sugar is a very direct inhibitor of autology and a fast state. Milk in your coffee, you know, that's, you know, the amount matter, like one tablespoon of milk or something, like 100 calories of milk probably is fine. But, um, you know, technically it's still, you know, kind of breaks the fast. But I wouldn't like, you know, worry about it that much. If you like to have milk in your coffee and it helps you to get through the fast, then like, why not? I don't think, I don't see like a issue with that. You don't need to be like a micromanaging <laughs> with it that much. Protein shakes and amino acids because they contain amino acids that inhibit autophagy and just yeah, anything that has food and calories, technically speaking, yes, they do break a fast, but whether or not they have any meaningful impact on the fasted physiology and the pathways that get activated in that fasted state is a different question. Like, um, yeah, it may not inherently stop AMPK and it may not inherently stop autophagy if it has calories. Uh, how to break a fast. So when, when you're pretty much, you know, done fasting, what I like to do is, yeah, like drink coffee and some electrolyte powders and um, things like that in the fasted state. If I'm about to break fast that, and it's like actual food, then I would, um, you know, start with something that is uh, easy to digest. So uh, getting some bone broth or some soup liquids is good, especially after a long fast, like multi-day fast that you want to want to do. You don't want to start with like high glycemic uh, foods because that can cause like some aspects of refeeding syndrome, which means that you get actually super hyperglycemic and uh, you can get some adverse reactions from that. To prevent that, you want to have adequate amount of uh, sodium and other electrolytes in your bloodstream before you break the fast. And uh, that's why like mineral waters are great and some of like electrolyte powders, even like regular salt in your water is a good way to you know prevent the refeeding syndrome. And it's actually quite important. Um, but still, when you are breaking a fast, I would start with something easy to digest and something that has like liquid and salt in it, like bone broth. Uh, the first food should still be somewhat low glycemic. You don't want to spike your insulin because uh, again, refeeding syndrome and uh, can actually cause you hypoglycemia. So what you want to eat instead is some like protein and uh, vegetables, something uh, that just, you know, gets your digestion going. Apple cider vinegar is great while breaking the fast to also help with the digestion. And then the second meal can be somewhat higher glycemic. You can eat some carbohydrates or something like that, but you want to, or if you eat like one meal a day, then I would start with protein and vegetables first and then have some of the carbohydrates uh, later. And the overall, you know, kind of theme is to still eat somewhat you know, normally. <laughs> Don't uh, be so ravenous and so like gorging yourself because that can just be, you know, obviously it de defeats a lot of the purpose of the fast and uh, can have like some negative side effects on your health. 
as well, or sleep or something like that. So I'd much rather just eat slow, eat steady, chew it properly, be mindful of your food, and uh, yeah, try to you know not overeat, which I think is still hard. Like most people, they find it hard to overeat if they're doing it or fasting. So here's how to do intermittent fasting. We're kind of reaching the end of the video as well. Some of the foods to eat while fasting. Uh, here's a list of kind of the main like whole foods. I think are the healthiest option. Obviously, uh, you don't you could get away with eating junk food when you're doing intermittent fasting. There are actually studies in mice at least that show that if they eat like a bad diet, high fat diet, uh, but they're doing intermittent fasting, then they're still healthy compared to those mice who eat the same bad uh, like a high fat uh, unhealthy diet uh, but they're not doing it over fasting then they're they get sick and obese so yeah you know fasting in some ways can like protect your body against uh the kind of harmful effects of eating ultra processed food or eating somewhat excessive amount of calories but uh like you know the vast majority of times you still choose whole foods um here's a list of the ones that i think are the best so like for protein beef chicken fish eggs Liver, beans, legumes, cottage cheese, vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, carrots, turnips, cucumber, tomatoes, spinach, etc. Carbs, potatoes, rice, bananas, apples, pears, pineapple, berries, quinoa, buckwheat, oats. Uh, and for fats, like olive oil, fish, egg yolks, cheese, uh, chicken skin, pork skin is actually good for uh, collagen and glycine, which is good for the, you know, the health benefits of, for the tendons and joints and as well as the skin and some like nuts and seeds for some other additional fat sources. But that's pretty much it. I mean, there's uh, like a whole list of more you could eat. I'm not going into the specific details of, you know, what type of meat, what type of vegetables, but whole foods, uh, meat, protein, fish, uh, vegetables, carbs, some healthy fats. Uh, I think that's kind of the main, um, you know, guideline. When it comes to the macronutrient ratios, then I do think that it's important to uh, opt for somewhat of a higher protein intake because that helps with muscle maintenance. And um, when you are fasting, then you do require still protein. Now, if you are on a low-protein diet plus fasting, then chances are you're going to lose muscle and become more frail. But uh, at least, like, you know, 25 to 30 percent of the calories should come from protein. If you're under higher calorie restriction, then the protein quantity should increase slightly because the protein helps to protect against the muscle loss that could have happened in the calorie restriction. So, yeah, like 35 up to 40 percent even uh, when you're in a severe calorie restriction, but the rest of the calories, carbs or fats, should come from like yeah, 70 percent, or should contribute up to 70 percent or 65, 60 percent, depending on the um, the type of diet you follow. I don't think that you need to be on a low carb diet. I don't think you need to be on a low fat diet. But uh, yeah, just the combined energy is what you get from them. So here's the conclusion of the video. Uh, daily what you want to aim for is about like 14 to 16 hours fasted at least that's when you, what you achieve by waiting a few hours after waking up and you stop eating a few hours uh, before bed in my opinion the you know minimum you should wait is like you know three to four hours before bed uh, i would recommend eating like one hour before bed or something like that three to four hours is kind of uh good if you want to take it a bit further than five to six hours but uh, some people do worse with this early time sheet eating that they can't sleep that well and they, again like they could lose muscle as well if they're not eating enough protein uh, exercise and sleep well obviously is also very important uh, exercise should be a part of intermittent fasting and you should do it regularly and at the same time you should also sleep if intermittent fasting starts to interfere with exercise and interferes with your sleep, then I think it's not worth it. Like it's more important to exercise and it's more important to sleep uh, than to do intermittent fasting. But uh, chances are you can do all of them. <laughs> and I think you should do all of them. When it comes to breaking the fast, then uh, do it slowly. Don't, again, overgorge and don't overeat. And uh, eat whole foods, protein, carbs. Uh, vegetables and fibers that's yeah just the basic things again if you want to master intermittent fasting and learn more details more the science then check out my intermittent fasting video course but other than that thanks for watching this video make sure you click the like subscribe notification bell as well my name is seem stay optimized stay empowered